Ova sesija je podeljena na tri dela. Prvi deo se tiče lečenja torako abdominalnih aneurizmi, otvoreno i endovaskorno. Drugi deo se tiče tretmana disekcija i komplikacija disekcija. I treći deo je prezentacija o traumi, tupoj traumi aorte. Imam čast da pozovem dekana Medicinskog fakulteta u Beoradu, profesora doktora Lazara Davidovića, da održi prvo predanje. Dobro jutro. Molim vas prvi slajd. Because of our distinguished guest, allow me to continue in, in English. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, authorities, Mr. Chairman, repair of thoracoabdominal aneurysms is, of course, the most challenging vascular procedure in contemporary practice. Uh, standard open repair, total endovascular repair, as well as hybrid procedure at, at disposal here. In the first part of my lecture, I will be focusing on the main indications for uh, open repair of thoracoabdominal aneurysms in uh, endovascular era. Because of short distal landing zones, severe angulation of the thoracic aorta, and inclusion of the inferior aorta, significant visceral stenosis, as well as small iliac diameter and iliac tortuosity, 20 to 40 percent of thoracoabdominal aneurysms are not suitable for total endovascular repair. So, uh, open repair should be considered as a first treatment option in patients with complex unfavorable anatomy with thoracoabdominal aneurysms. As you know, uh, endovascular repair is not recommended in patients with connective tissue disorders, namely the friability of the aortic uh, wall in these patients uh, seems to be incompatible with radial forces of implanted stent graft. Therefore, endolic type 1 and stent graft migration uh, can occur. Uh, because of that, majority of authors recommend IVAR, uh, namely TIVAR, in patients with connective tissue disorders only uh, as a bridging method to open surgery in emergency cases, including rupture and severe malperfusion. TIVAR is also recommended if patients with connective tissue disorders have significant comorbidity. But in last majority of uh, thoracoabdominal aneurysms caused by connective tissue disorders, open surgery should be the first choice. Uh, according to some most recently published articles, uh, there is no significant difference regarding early mortality and uh, neurological complications between uh, open and total endovascular repair of thoracoabdominal aneurysms. At the same time, uh, total endovascular repair is followed with significantly higher risk of required long-term brain interventions due to this open repair should be considered as a first treatment option uh, in good risk patients with degenerative thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Uh, several long-term complications after pr uh, prior TVAR require mostly, mostly late open surgical conversion. To be honest, the incidence of these procedures, these complications, is higher than previously thought, including very experienced endovascular centers. The protection of the spinal cord and visceral organs is the most challenging procedure during open repair of thoracoabdominal aneurysms. It should include cerebrospinal fluid drainage, segmental sequential aortic cross clamping, selective retrograde perfusion of visceral organs, moderate hypothermia, as well as reattachment of all suitable, significant intercostal and lumbar arteries. In the following slides, I will try to explain the main steps. Procedure begins with cerebrospinal fluid drainage that should be established in, before surgery, and con it continues in the following 72 hours. Cerebrospinal fluid pressure has to be lower than 10 millimeters of mercury, and at the same time, it can be, uh, drainage volume cannot be higher than 10 millimeters per hour. Uh, in comparison to standard cannula, new bidirectional arterial cannula, as well as side arm technique of cannulation, 
can prevent uh, development of uh, the ischemia of the left leg during the entire surgery that can be prolonged sometimes for more than eight hours. Thanks to that, myoglobin level is significantly reduced, which minimizes its dreadful effect on the renal function. The main purpose of so-called segmental sequential aortic cross clamping is to exclude the shortest segment of thoracoabdominal aorta from the circulation as possible. By doing this, a distal pool for retrograde perfusion of visceral organs is created. Uh, continuous perioperative neuromonitoring of motor evoked potential is at the moment the best method that uh, shows which of intercostal arteries uh, should be replanted and which of them can be legated. Uh, we perform protection of visceral organs during uh, reattachment of fistural arteries using selective retrograde perfusion through celiac trunk, SMA, and both renal arteries. Instead, standard Karel patch technique, which is the best and the quickest option for reattachment of fistural arteries in patients with very sick aorta, Marfan patients, as well as in cases of post dissecting aneurysms, all visceral branches should be replanted separately. Uh, uh, this maneuver prevents late development of visceral patch aneurysms. So, uh, during uh, such strategy, uh, distal aortic anastomosis should be finished immediately after the attachment of intercostal arteries. That allows earlier reestablishment of anterograde flow through left hypogastric artery, as well as it allows uh, better anterograde perfusion of the distal part of the spinal cord. The last step is reattachment of uh, visceral arteries using these branches of multi-branched aortic graft. My clinic performed routinely open repair of thoracoabdominal aneurysm since 2000. Until now, we had almost 400 patients. In 2000, perioperative mortality was less than percent, while perioperative paraplegia rate was less than 5%. Professor Alberto Chiesa, one of the world's leading experts in this area, has included our clinic on the map of European centers that perform uh, this procedure routinely. That is a great honor and privilege for us, of, of course. Open repair of thoracoabdominal aneurysms should not be forgotten in endovascular era. It can be performed only in high volume centers by very educated multidisciplinary aortic team. Due to this, younger generation of vascular surgeons should be educated in both endovascular but also in a standard and complex open aortic surgery. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Theodosius Bizdas to have a talk about uh, endovascular repair of uh, thoracoabdominal aneurysm. Theo, please. Thank you, Igor. Uh, Professor David David, it's a great honor, uh, and thank you for the very kind invitation. So, uh, of course, I'm going to talk about endovascular repair. You heard that uh, open surgery, of course, has still uh, the indications, but uh, at the moment we are running in the era where the majority of the thoracoabdominals uh, aneurysms can be treated by endovascular means. So the uh, question was uh, open surgery versus endovascular repair. This uh, question has been answered already because we have uh, several uh, papers in the uh, literature. One of the best is coming from Cleveland Clinic where Roy Greenberg and uh, Lars Venson, they uh, compared in a propensity score analysis um, the uh, open and the endovascular repair and they have seen that there was no difference in uh, survival. There was a number of difference regarding spinal cord ischemia, time of onset and and uh, so goes on, uh, but at the end, survival was uh, the same between the two treatment strategies. The uh, second question that always comes up is, um, you know, endovascular repair means um, a lot of reinterventions. However, if you see papers uh, from the Brands and Fenestrated endographs, but also between 
custom made and uh, off the shelf devices, their intervention free survival was above 90%. Now the question is what is coming up? What is the, um, the late, let's say, the last update regarding the endovascular repair of thoraco abdominal aortic aneurysms? And I will focus on aortic arch aneurysm and the thoraco abdominal aorta. Regarding the aortic arch aneurysms, we know the gold standard. Uh, however, this gold standard is associated with high mortality rate and stroke rate. Uh, in very dedicated centers, of course, the rates are really much lower. The same is also for the thoracoabdominal aorta. But if we're looking at the, uh, at the whole map, uh, the, the rates are very similar to those numbers. The hybrid arts repair with uh, elephant trunk and frozen elephant trunk technique is the new treatment strategy. It is not everywhere available, and the mortality rate is around 13%. Now uh, comes to the endovascular repair. What we have available is at the moment from the four different strategies, the uh, chimney sandwich technique and the brand stand grafts. Regarding the uh, chimney technique, this is a case from Athens where we had this uh, contained rupture of the aortic arts in a 90 years old uh, patient. Uh, everybody denied to treat this uh, patient, but if you see, we can really find a nice solution for this uh, multimorbid patients to treat and not to, to uh, let him die from uh, the aneurysm. And now Another indication for chimney endografting is this kind of uh, symptomatic around 8.5 centimeter uh, thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm after a type A uh, dissection uh, where you need an urgent uh, treatment uh, due to the symptomatic uh, presentation. And in that case, we have performed uh, a double chimney for the brachiocephalic trunk, a left carotid, common carotid artery, and the periscope technique. Uh, this is the periscope technique uh, where you see that the branch is getting down uh, in order to have the ability to perform then uh, the multi-branch um, endograph to treat the whole aorta. Um, so uh, the chimney endografting, however, has limitations. One, some of them is the gutter associated end leak, is the opposing forces, and um, the asymmetric uh, state expansion. For this reason, at the moment, what is actually uh, the gold standard is to use custom-made devices like the one here from Cook Medical. Uh, it needs, uh, it is not everywhere available, uh, so you need really uh, um, dedicated centers to perform this. Uh, and then we have also the Terumo Relay, uh, which is actually very similar design. However, the main problem still remains the custom-made uh, character. Uh, so for this reason, now we have a single branch uh, of the self-aortic art stand graft. Um, this is the Nexus from Cryolife. Uh, it is a single branch, and you need to do a carotid, uh, carotid subclavian bypass. Uh, and this is a case that we have done the first one in uh, Cyprus uh, with uh, further than uh, thoracoabdominal aortic repair. We have at the moment uh, experience with eight patients, no mortality, stroke, or dysphagia, which is actually because we are going retroesophageal, uh, and the mean hospital stays around four days. It is a very good uh, treatment strategy if you have replaced previously the ascending aorta uh, after, and we have a further dilatation of the aortic arts, or you had a type A dissection that you have replaced only the uh, ascending aorta and you have further dissection membrane uh, in the aortic arts. Uh, what we need, uh, of course, still remains an um, trans uh, percutaneous approach, but we need at least to have the inner uh, length of the graft to be more than 2.5 centimeter in order to have a good landing zone for the dedicated stent graft. Now going to the thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms, we have all these three uh, treatment strategies. Let's start from the sandwich endografting. This is uh, the uh, treatment strategy where you're uh, inserting first an EVA a TVAR through the uh, thoracic endograft, you are uh, having long stent grafts inside the uh, visceral arteries, and then you have a sandwich technique with a third uh, stent graft. Actually, it is very rare to use this kind of technique, but we had such a case with a nine centimeter uh, aneurysm after a fenestrated device where the, uh, the renal arteries, the branches are, the, the fenestrations are looking downwards. It is no go for a branch endograft. So uh, we couldn't use also a fenestrated endograft. So in these cases, we decided decided to go uh, for um, first to cannulate after the TVAR uh, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and then to go from below to uh, in get into the right renal and the left renal artery, and then to perform uh, the sandwich technique with a very good result uh, at the end.
However, uh, we talk about gutters associated endolic. If you're doing a very good oversizing, if you're doing uh, a good planning, uh, we have seen in this paper that uh, the, the gutter is staying in the post-operative era. However, at two months and later at 12 months, it has been uh, completely thrombosed. Custom-made endographs, the question is uh, if we need them. Yes, we need them. This is a, a, pa a patient we has uh, repaired for a thoracic abdominal aneurysm with a Ballard technique, uh, and in this case, there is no go for an open surgery. So we have designed a specific, uh, really dedicated uh, branched endograft uh, in order to exclude this aneurysm, and we have uh, seen a very nice result at the end. Um, now we have of the cell solutions, we have the T-Brands, it is only one device with one diameter and one length. Uh, it was actually the leader uh, during the last years uh, in the treatment of uh, thoracic abdominal aortic aneurysms. And uh, now we have a new device and this is the, uh, sorry, uh, can you please go back? Um, this is the new device that uh, actually uh, it has inner branches. That means uh, there are pre-cannulated. You can go very quickly uh, through uh, the branches uh, outside from uh, the aorta and to um, get inside the target vessels. So uh, then after the Nexus 10 graft, which is now since one year and we have very good experience, we have done uh, also the first uh, 4D MRI uh, flow in order to see uh, the dynamics uh, inside the, um, the stent graft, which seems that uh, this, now it stops, I don't know what happens. Okay, let's go from here. So very quickly um, after this, which are the unmet needs? What do we still uh, do not have optimized um, in the endovascular repair? First of all is the spinal cord ischemia. We still have rates around 19%. What we are doing, stage procedure, that means first the TVR, eight weeks later the branch endograft, rapid restoration of distal perfusion or even uh, use of an open branch for some weeks and liberal stenting of the hypogastric arteries in order to support the the, um, the collateral network. We are trying to use custom-made devices if we need to, uh, to reduce uh, the aortic coverage, so we're avoiding, for example, the off-the-self devices. We're preferring a device that is shorter with the right diameter. And uh, the big problem still in the endovascular era is the renal arteries, when especially they have a cephalid orientation. Uh, in that case, uh, we know exactly that uh, the um, the fenestrations are better uh, than uh, the branches. Um, now, regarding the cephalid orientation, we saw that uh, if we have long branches with a long of tortuosity, we have seen in a several in the paper that uh, this is a risk factor for occlusion. So that means we're trying to avoid uh, long branches with a lot of uh, elongation uh, because this increase around five times the, the risk of uh, occlusion. There are a lot of bridging stent grafts. However, none of them is uh, CE approved. Uh, so everything you can use whatever you want. There is no, there are no guidelines regarding this. Uh, at the moment, we know that both uh, balloon expandable and self expandable are equally good. Uh, and at the moment, we have more renal events than uh, visceral events. Um, what we have seen is that the renal artery uh, increases as risk factor uh, the risk of thrombosis 13 times. The, and this is the reason why we still need a dedicated bridging stent graft and we are trying to avoid relining because, as you will see here in the picture, uh, the, the bare metal stand is getting here and is injuring uh, the vessel causing uh, thrombosis. Finally, what we have seen, and this is a very important finding, is that uh, we nobody knows what happens with uh, the movement of the stand graft inside the aneurysm. This is a brand endograft in an aneurysm. We had 66 millimeter diameter. After the uh, reduction of the diameter, the stent graft fault uh, at the, behind uh, in the other part of the aneurysm and pulled out all the bridging stent grafts from the target vessels. This is complications that they have not been uh, reported frequently in the literature, but this is what we see sometimes in our uh, patients. For these reasons, we have done an in vitro test to see the different bridging stent grafts, and uh, here is the endoskeleton of the different uh, bridging stent grafts. And what we have seen is regarding permeability, pull out force, and shear stress, VBX and B graft are doing at the moment the best job.
So uh, in uh, summary, um, the number of different techniques and devices are now available in the endovascular and minimally invasive um, treatment of TAAAs and aortic arts aneurysms. High technical success rate and safety. Long term shows good uh, durability and efficacy. Uh, however, we're still uh, missing CE or FDA approved uh, bridging stent grafts and this is the Achilles heel of uh, the endovascular repair. Dedicated aortic centers, as Professor Davidovich said, is not is actually the solution to avoid all these uh, complications. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dizas. Please join us here. Uh, the two presentations are open for discussion. Do we have a questions from the audience? There is one. Please, microphone. Uh, should I speak in uh, English or not? Yeah, because in English, okay. Uh, Zoran Rancic, um, vascular surgeon. Um, I thank you for very nice discussion that you made here, both the centers, the Belgrade and in Athens. I uh, congratulate the business that he moved now to Athens. I didn't know this. I knew that, but I didn't know exactly. My question to both of you is, it's definitely that the treatment of this thoracic abdomen aneurysm is very difficult and the uh, option open surgical endovascular on a hybrid procedure is the the most important to opt the best option for treatment of this patient how do you decide in your clinic in Belgrade and how do you decide in your clinic in um, Athens how to proceed what about the aortic board do you collaborate with cardiac surgeon to decide the option what to do in cases when you don't have availability of uh, endovascular stand grass we heard about the branch fenestrated in situ fenestration t branch and everything and uh, how to solve this problem i think this is not so much political question but i think the question is about how to treat these patients thank you very much so um let's say that um Due to the fact that uh, I have been trained also in a big aortic center in Hanover Medical School um, with cardiac surgeons and aortic surgeons there, uh, I still think that the open surgery is uh, really a very invasive uh, treatment strategy. So what I'm trying always is to avoid uh, the open surgery uh, if we are talking about, uh, if we're not talking about young patients or patients with connective tissue disorders. So uh, especially if you have uh, difficulties with the anatomy and for me the main difficulty is uh, the access vessels because for these devices you need around 24 or even 22 friends uh, seats is to make a small hybrid procedure for example with a bypass on the common iliac artery to advance the device um, it is very 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 rare to see a difficult anatomy in the reno visceral uh, part uh, that it is not applicable uh, for a for an off the self or even a custom made device um, regarding the connective tissue disorders, at the moment there is a new strategy around the world uh, where they are uh, preparing a good landing zone proximally and distally. That means they are uh, replacing the aortic arts or even only the ascending aorta. They are replacing the abdominal aorta and these both uh, these areas are used for a landing zone of uh, stent grafts. And uh, we have more and more cases with uh, patients with connective tissue disorders that are treated uh, endovascularly. We don't know what about the visceral vessels and the landing zone inside the visceral vessels. This is something that we still uh, need to evaluate in the uh, follow-up of those patients. Uh, and one case is for me a no-go for the endovascular repair, and this is the uh, infection of the graft. You need to go uh, for an open surgery. Uh, and uh, another issue is, of course, the need of the patient. So uh, as it is also with the abdominal aortic aneurysms, nowadays it has to be discussed with the patient what is uh, the, uh, the preferred option. This is not only the surgeon that says, this is uh, what we have to do, because both treatment strategies in good hands are, uh, are um, leading to equally good outcomes. Can I continue? Yes. As you know, at the moment, uh, we have uh, important economic limitations regarding uh, total endovascular repair. To be honest, uh, the price of uh, multi-branched, uh, namely uh, endovascular fenestrated or branched stand grafts are unacceptable, very expensive for national healthcare system in Serbia. But 
when we would have uh, option for that, I think that our main indication for open repair should be unfavorable aneurysmal anatomy, uh, patients with connective tissue disorders, but also younger good, lead, uh, good risk patients with degenerative thoracoabdominal aneurysms, and finally, some patients with some long-term complications uh, after prior TVAR. Uh, in the decision-making process regarding the treatment option, in our clinic are included vascular surgeons, uh, uh, anesthesiologists, as well as cardiologists. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Any more questions from the audience? I have a question for... Uh, there is a question? Yes, here, sorry. Dr. Ilic. Uh, Dr. Nikolic, vascular surgeon. So, first of all, thank you for your very nice presentation, both of you. I have a question for Professor Bizdas. So, we all know that the still phenomenon during open uh, thoracodominal aortic surgery is a huge risk for, for spinal cord ischemia. So, I want to know, what do you think about, uh, is there a still phenomena in endovascular surgery? Uh, can we compare endolic type 2 as a still phenomenon since the, since the pressure in, inside the enzymatic sac is always lesser in comparison with spinal cord network? So could be the, the persistent endolic type 2 causing uh, perhaps still phenomenon and the possibility of spinal cord ischemia is, is higher in that particular case. Thank you. This is a really excellent question, and we have, um, we have tried uh, when I was in Germany because we had a big series at that time in order to analyze patients with, with and without type 2 endolic if they have spinal cord ischemia. It is very difficult to be sure that it is, and this, we have sent this paper uh, because we have seen that type 2 endolic causes more paraparesis than uh, having no type 2 endolic. But the main, uh, let's say, a comment from the reviewers was that uh, you never know if it is, is a type 2 endolic. Um, and uh, this paper still is uh, really uh, under writing and submission because nobody can really um, be sure that type 2 endolic is a type 2 endolic in the thoracoabdominal era. Um, the point is that, yes, the question is you may have a still phenomenon. However, uh, the, what we have seen in the endovascular era, we don't see. We see very, very rare paraplegia. We see a lot of paraparesis, and we see this parapara paraparesis later than 72 hours. That means you may send the patient in a very good condition at home, and then in the second week, he will come and he will say, I cannot move my legs. I have problems uh, when the, the pressure is falling down. So uh, it is a question that I cannot answer at the moment, uh, but uh, it is, uh, we have a high suspicion that type 2 end leak, persistent type 2 end leak, can cause paraparesis. Thank you very much. Professor, you want to answer? Yes. Thank you. Only one short comment regarding previous subject. Namely, I would like to remind all uh, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen from the audience that Dr. Ilic has published a few very interesting uh, articles regarding that subject. Thank you. And uh, is there any questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question for the two of you. Well, it is obvious that we need to offer to patients both techniques, but is it really possible that you develop both techniques? Because these both uh, options are very complicated. As Professor said, only five centers are on the map of Europe uh, report performing open. How is in Greece? Few centers are performing uh, endovascular. So how, yeah, how to develop a center and how to educate people to do both? What do you think, both of you? I think it is uh, in the majority of the countries that uh, I was, uh, especially in Germany, but also now in Greece, it is a matter of political uh, situation. And this is actually where actually the situation is really depressive because uh, instead of working together cardiac surgeons and vascular surgeons and uh, causing that what we call an aortic surgeon that can uh, discuss in a, you know, in a big round if we're going to do endo or open, uh, this kind of surgeon is still missing in the majority of the countries. Uh, and I have uh, rarely seen clinics that they are really very good at both treatment strategies. They're in an excellent way. So in my opinion, um, we have to, in every country, and this is a matter of cost effectiveness, we have to bring dedicated specialists, 
not dedicated center, dedicated specialists uh, to decide what you have to do with the patient and all the specialists in the same room. And then you can send the patient to one or the other dedicated hospitals. I think that our center should include total endovascular repair in, in the following years. Due to this, it is necessary to continue with education of younger vascular surgeons in leading European endovascular centers as well. At the same time, so of course, we will continue with development of our open program. Thank you very much. Due to the sake of time, we have to continue. Our dean is busy. He, we can let him go. And Theo, you, you will stay with us. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. So we continue with the online presentation from Dr. Ivo Petrov, another endovascular center in the region in Sofia. Ivo, can you hear us? Very well. Thank you, Igor. Thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure and honor to be, to be among you. Unfortunately, not in presence, but hopefully in the future, yes. Thank you very much. You can proceed with your presentation. Uh, we're Great. here. Very glad to hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I will speak about uh, totally endovascular repair uh, of uh, complex cases of aortic dissection, uh, namely re-dissection and new dissection after uh, previous surgery. I have nothing to disclose regarding this presentation uh, except that everything is off-label that I, I will show you. So what about aortic type A dissection? Uh, still, there is, uh, in many cases, uh, there is uh, uh, problematic uh, regarding uh, redissection or persisting dissection after the surgical treatment. The so-called distal anastomotic new dissection, DAIN, is, uh, can be reached uh, uh, 38%. In this situation, the pressurized false lumen increases the risk of aortic growth and extremely compressed room and causes symptomatic malperfusion. And unfortunately, uh, worse uh, clinical result regarding mortality and stroke. And uh, at least half of these patients definitely require reoperation because the natural evolution is uh, very bad. Uh, but uh, again, unfortunately, the open surgical redo surgery is uh, uh, characteristic with more than 10% of uh, complication rate, including mortality. Uh, probably because of that, uh, endovascular options uh, are under discussion and under investigation. In this very, uh, in this uh, relatively recent meta-analysis uh, by Andrasi, uh, the endovascular uh, option showed uh, uh, quite a good results uh, compared to uh, hybrid or total open open repair. And probably this is one of the reason uh, in uh, the previous and the recent European guideline, in case of repeated aortic surgery need, the guideline advises us uh, to uh, discuss and to use endovascular stenting, endovascular options, and also in cases of malperfusion syndrome related to type A aortic dissection. What are the, in fact, the challenges? There are many. The main challenge for chimney technique, uh, the main challenge for chimney technique are the proximity of the aortic valve, the angulated morphology in many cases, and the involvement of the supraortic branches. And because of that, to protect the supraortic branches with chimneys, it's not an easy task because these patients are very complex, not only by clinical, but also by anatomical point of view. And I will show you uh, in our growing aortic experience during the years, totally endovascular, I will show you uh, among our series of totally endovascular repair of the arch in seven cases, this was done in patients that were previously operated for type A aortic dissection, and they had persistent or new type A aortic dissection. So uh, these were patients with the persisting of the flap 
into the aortic arch. So with the full involvement of the brachiocephalic trunk and the left carotid artery. And in this uh, experience, uh, we had uh, one patient died uh, because of uh, late uh, uh, dissection of the thoracic aorta. And uh, unfortunately, the patient was uh, LS Danlos uh, positive. Uh, you know uh, that the, the risk in LS Danlos is, uh, is uh, very high. So uh, the first case that I will uh, want to share with you, it's a young 57 year male. He was operated approximately one year before the index procedure. And he appeared in our clinic with uh, very severe dizziness and chest pain during uh, even little elevation of the arterial pressure. When we, decide, when we examined him, uh, by imaging, we saw that uh, unfortunately, just after the surgical graft, he had new entry into the ascending aorta, causing severe compression of the left carotid artery and also the visceral uh, vessels uh, lumen. You see the, in fact, the dissection that is involving the brachiocephalic vessels with compression of the, of the true lumen by the, the false lumen. So we have discussed all the options, the branching, uh, totally uh, surgical repair, hybrid repair. But finally, we decided to use totally endovascular repair because the left carotid artery was extremely dissected. So the branching was uh, questionable for the left carotid artery. And because of that, we decided to perform totally endovascular with a direct carotid puncture of the left carotid artery for the chimney and uh, brachial artery, right brachial artery for the chimney into the brachiocephalic trunk. This is the access uh, with the retrograde puncture of the carotid artery that was closed by the, uh, uh, the closure device uh, by ProGlide. And this is the position of both chimneys on the left panel, the position of both chimneys uh, within the surgical graft as a landing zone. So we have utilized uh, the surgical graft as a proximal landing zone for the uh, insertion of the valiant captiva aortic graft. And this is the final angio showing excellent result both for the carotid uh, artery and for the aortic with total disappearance of the false lumen. You see, there is no more false lumen here. And we now have a two year uh, follow up, uh, absolutely asymptomatic and very good imaging result, both for the carotid and the aortic, uh, aortic endograft. Okay, the second case is uh, even more complex. Uh, it's a patient gentleman, 69 year old. He had the history of uh, uh, type A aortic dissection surgery in 2012. And after that, uh, sequentially, he had uh, MFM cardiatis implantation into the extremely compressed through lumen and valiant captiva is a prolongation of the, uh, to the proximal part of the thoracic aorta. Unfortunately, the false lumen reached 10 centimeters and he in fact had uh, voice loss and very big uh, thoracic pain uh, in this situation. And we decided to, uh, uh, with the enthusiasm from the first case, we decided to perform the same, to put uh, retrograde carotid uh, uh, puncture in order to put the chimney and also uh, the both uh, brachial and subclavian vessels uh, to, to perform chimney into the uh, brachiocephalic uh, vessels. This is the chimney uh, through the brachial artery for the uh, brachiocephalic trunk, you see. And uh, you see the, uh, the second chimney from the left carotid uh, in position already. And this is the implantation of the valiant uh, parallel, parallel to, the, to the chimneys. And this is the triple kissing balloon inflation in order to accommodate the chimneys and the valiant. And this is the proglite insertion and enclosure. And this is the final result. You see that the huge false lumen was almost immediately isolated uh, uh, from, the, from the flow with a very good result. And this is a third case. Uh, we, we published this series of cases. This is again a, a third case uh, with uh, after surgical intervention into the ascending aorta with persistence of the false lumen and the result after the totally percutaneous chimney. And uh, uh, I mentioned uh, already into the, into the paper and also into the presentation, this was done 
under conscious sedation without general anesthesia. As a conclusion, I will say that the open surgery remains the gold standard for the treatment of type A aortic dissection, no doubt. But endovascular techniques are emerging as viable option for treatment of complex cases of uh, new dissection and uh, for with the need of uh, redo redoing intervention and the chimney technique with total endovascular approach under under conscious sedation can be and resulted in our uh, case there is uh, a good option to treat uh, this kind of patients and thank you very much for your attention Thank, thank you very much. You can use uh, translation in Zoom. We will have um, questions at the end, although you probably Razborish Srpski, whatever you prefer. Uh, I understand Serbian, so uh, please uh, speak freely and I will answer in English. Okay. Dr. Sladević, uh, endovascular knowledge dissection or TTB, Iskustva Kliniki za vascular chirurgiju. KCS. Poštovani profesori, koleginice i kolege, moje ime je Milo Šladević u klinici za vaskovnu endovaskovnu hirurgiju Univerzitetskog kliničkog centra Srbije. Do sada smo radili 74 pacijenata zbog akutne disekcije TIP B. Sa ovim tretmanom smo počeli 2014. godine, a zahvaljujući dostupnosti torakalnih stand graftova, od 2017. ovaj tretman je uveden u redovnu praksu i tretman akutne disekcije TIP B. 12 pacijenata je tretirano zbog intramuralnih hematoma, njih 62 zbog disekcije, neki od njih su bili u kombinaciji disekcije intramuralni hematom. 29 pacijenata, odnosno 39 procenata, je tretirano zbog malperfuzijonih sindroma, zbog malperfuzije donjih ekstremiteta, viscelane malperfuzije, malperfuzije bubrega ili neuroloških simptoma donjih ekstremiteta. 9 pacijenata smo tretirali zbog akutne disekcije sa rukturom decedentne aorte, a najveći broj pacijenata, 49 procenata, je tretiran zbog perzistirajućih bolova uprkos antihipertenzinoj terapiji i potencijalno komplikovanih disekcija. Endovaskularni tretman u našoj klinici podrazumeva implantaciju stand grafta u pravi lumen. Pokrivali smo najčešće celu torakalnu aortu od luka do trunkosa celijakosa ili do blizu trunkosa celijakosa, a kod samo četiri pacijenata smo koristili jedan graft od 150 mm. Rutinski smo kod najvećeg broja pacijenata koristili i drenažu likvora. U nekim slučajima smo radili, ako je bilo potrebno, i debranching luka aorte, a kod nekih pacijenata nakon neadekvatne reoskorizacije i ekstra anatomske bypasse ili implantaciju stenta u ilijačne ili visceralne arterije. Najčešće smo u 50% slučajeva radili karotidu subklavijalni bypass i tevar. 30% pacijenata je rađeno samo tevar, a najređe je bila potreba za karotidu karotidu subklavijalnim bypassom i tevarom. Kod 20 pacijenata morali smo da radimo i dodatne procedure u cilju revaskularizacije ciljnih organa. Kada su u pitanju donji ekstremiteti, Kod njih četvoro ekstranatomske rekonstrukcije, crossover, kod jednog pacijenta smo morali i axilobifemoralni bypass, implantacija stentova ili stent grafta u ilijačne arterije. Kod dvoje pacijenata, nakon tretmana zbog vicelane ishemije, radili smo laboratomiju ili jako mezenterični bypass. Kod njih troje implantaciju stenta ili pokrivenih stentova u viceralne arterije. Tri pacijenata su zahtevala stentovanje renalnih arterija, a također kod tri pacijenta smo prepokrivali infrarenalnu aortu endovaskularnim graftovima. Kod jednog je ostao kolaps pravog lumena i nakon tretmana, endovaskularnog tretmana torakalne aorte. Kod drugog je postojao veliki re-entry u infrarenalnoj aorti i kod trećeg zbog značajnog porasta diametra infrarenalne aorte na kontrolnom MSCT pregledu. Najčešća komplikacija u postoperativnom toku je bila anurija, a od ostalih komplikacija Sretali smo se sa moždanim udarom, srčanim udarom i neurološkim deficitom donjih ekstremiteta. Naglasio bih da paraplegije, kod ovih pacijenta koje su ostale paraplegije i nakon operacije, oni su i došli sa neurološkim deficitom. U našoj seriji mortalitet je bio 15%, 11 oro pacijenata, 4 od 9 pacijenata koji su tretirani zbog rupturirane aneurizme su preminuli, 
tri pacijenta koji su tretirani zbog vicerane ishemije i troje njih koji su tretirani zbog uznapredovali ishemije oba donje ekstremiteta. Naglasio bi da je samo jedan smrtni slučaj bio nakon tretmana nekomplikovanih disekcija tip B. Ostalih 35 pacijenta koji su tretirani zbog prezistirajućih bolova ili potencijalno komplikovane disekcije su imali uredan postoperativni tok. Na kraju bih zaključio da je pravovremeno prepoznavanje diagnostika veoma važni u uspehu endovaskulnog tretmara akutno je komplikovane disekcije. Endovaskulni tretman potencijalno komplikovanih disekcija ima izrazito nizak intrahospitalni mortalitet, a da komplikovane disekcije sa mezitelnom ishemijom i širenjem disekcije, statičkom disekcijom visceralnih arterija su najteže za tretman i nose najveći rizik od neuspeha endovaskulnog tretmana i smrtnog slučaja. Hvala vam na pažnju. Hvala doktoru Sadeviću. Otvaram diskusiju na temu ova dva predavanja. Znači, doktor Petrov je pozvao da postavljate pitanja na srpskom jeziku. Hi, my name is Theo Bistas from Athens. Congrats for the nice presentation. I have a question because when we are doing chimney endografting the aortic arts, we have two problems. The first one is what are you doing and what kind of device are you suggesting if the patient has a mechanic valve? And the second question is, uh, I have personally uh, difficulties to select the right branch for the brachiocephalic trunk because uh, in the vast majority of the cases you have a diameter around 14 millimeter uh, and balloon expandable stent grafts are, do, are causing uh, really big gutters. So what I am doing, for example, I'm taking gore devices and I'm taking the iliac side branch which is 16 millimeter uh, approximately and 12 millimeter distally, it is tapered, to use it as a, um, as a branch for the brachiocephalic trunk. So uh, these are the two questions. Again, congrats for the excellent presentation. Thank you, Theo. Both questions are extremely important. It's absolutely true. There are several very important uh, tips and tricks. Probably the, the, the biggest one, the most important, in order the, the aortic graft to accommodate the chimneys is the oversizing. So we need at least 20%, even more, 25% of oversizing of the aortic graft in order to accommodate the chimney grafts by the carotid and the brachiocephalic trunk in order to avoid uh, the gutters that uh, you mentioned already. For the brachiocephalic trunk, and even more, in case of uh, uh, bovine arch, bovine uh, chimney, bo bovine arch, it's even more complex because in this situation, the brachiocephalic trunk is even bigger. And uh, in this situation, uh, we, uh, we have used, uh, uh, of course, we are using ma mainly Bentley. We are a uh, big graft. Uh, big graft is possible to, do, to be oversized after the implantation. For example, the 10 millimeter uh, big graft can be uh, uh, oversized up to 14, but with the caution that uh, this oversizing post ballooning is causing shrinkage, is causing shortening of the, of the big, uh, big graft. So this is first. And for uh, really big, uh, uh, big uh, brachiocephalic uh, trunks, we have used uh, in several cases, of course, off-label, the endurant iliac, iliac graft uh, that we have used by a subclavian, subclavian approach with uh, uh, or uh, percutaneous or uh, limited surgical approach. So it's a, a possible uh, avoidance of the gutter, of the, of the space between the graft and the brachiocephalic vessel. Thank you. In two cases, we also use the iliac branch for uh, in, in, in these situations. Da ima pitanja iz publike za ova dva predavača? In fact, I wanted to ask you, uh, 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 the colleague, uh, your colleague, uh, regarding the uh, the drainage. Uh, uh, you mentioned the carotid subclavian uh, the branching, carotid to subclavian bypass and also the, the drainage. Do you routinely, uh, when you cover the subclavian artery, do you routinely perform carotid subclavian bypass 
or you take a look at the vertebral vessels and in case both vertebral vessels and the communication between them is good, you don't uh, perform this uh, carotid subclavian bypass. Mirutinski, when we cover the left subclavian artery, when we plan to cover the left subclavian artery, we do carotid subclavian bypass. We don't measure Willisov Šestugo. The only reason when we stop is that the patients who we treated because of the dissection with the rupture, who were thermodynamically unstable, and we decided that it would be added to the time for the bypass, and it would be bad for the patient to be able to wait for the TEVAR. Also, if we cover the width of 20 mm, we will do the routine drainage liquid. I understand. If you allow me, I will share with you that uh, we have covered more than 250 subclavian arteries without bypassing them in advance. We had only one case of uh, uh, really a very deep uh, brain ischemia. And uh, uh, after, uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we performed by emergency carotid subclavian bypass. And after looking back uh, at the city, we saw that uh, there was a really discrepancy between the diameters, the size of the both vertebral arteries. In case uh, there is a huge uh, asymmetry between the left and the right uh, uh, vertebral artery, in this situation, we have to perform uh, carotid to subclavian bypass uh, in order to avoid ischemia, mainly brain ischemia, because of the steel syndrome. And uh, in some cases, we even more we put plug in the subclavian ostium, left subclavian ostium, in order to avoid and to leak to the dissected, to the false lumen, in order to to preclude the filling of the of the false lumen. And I think that it's really crucial to take a look at the vertebral arteries before doing the 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 bypass. Thank you for the recommendation. Thank you. Our 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 experience is completely different. We had a lot of strokes uh, when we had to cover subclavian arteries. So, but I understand your experience as well. So, for the sake of time, we have to continue for the next presentation. Was your doctor Budakova? Thank you once Thank again. You, Thank you, Ivo. Thank you very much. Bye. Stay safe. You too. Poštovane koleginice i kolege, ja sam doktor Nebojša Budak u sa klinike za vaskovarnu i endovaskovarnog hirurgiju u kliničkog centra Vojvodinja i ispričat ću vam rad na temu našeg iskustva u tretmanu tupe povrede i smišne aorte. Dakle, znamo da tupe povrede torakalne aorte su veoma teške povrede, predstavljaju drugi najčešći uzrok smrti od tupe traume, nose veliku smrtnost, čak 85% je smrtnost na licu mesta, najčešća lokalizacija povređivanja je i smišna aorte. Ovde je prikazana šema koje su to sile koje deluju na torakalnu aortu kod dejstva tupe traume i samim tim nastajanje tih lezija na tipičnom mestu. Ponovimo stepen povređivanja, dakle imamo četiri gradusa. Prvi gradus je intimalni tir, drugi gradus je intramuralni hematom ili eventualno nešto veći intimalni flak. Gradus 3 je pseudoaneurizma i gradus 4 je ruptura. Naglasit ćemo da je kod gradusa 1 moguće i konzervativan način lečenja, dok ostala tri tipa zahtevaju aktivno lečenje. Kako je teko istorija tretmana, 1957. godine je urađen prvi uspešan tretman ove povrede, otvoreno hiruški naravno. Do 1999. godine i medijanta hiruška intervencija bila zlatni standard. Nakon toga, uočeno je da određena grupa pacijenata ima korist od odloženog tretmana, to su dakle bili pacijenti sa kardijalnim rizikom, kogulopatijom i signifikantnim udruženim povredama glave, pluća, solnih organa i karlice, te su tako počeli da budu i tretirani ti pacijenti, znači unutar prvih 24 sata. Međutim, onda je 1997. je urađen prvi tevar, kod ove povrede i nekoliko godina nakon toga tevar postaje zlatni standard u tretmanu ovih povrede. 
naše iskustvo, dakle mi smo u poslednjih sedam godina tretirali devet pacijenata sa ovim tipom povrede, otvoreno hiruški smo lečili pet i tevarom četiri. Otvorena hirurgija je rađena kroz levu postaru, lateralnu torakotomiju, interpozicijom grafta, klempet sa tehnikom, u singlu angu ventilaciju i spinalnu drenažu. Endovaskularni tretman je rađen kroz otvoreni femoralni pristup plasmanom stand grafta sa ili bez pokrivanja odstupa potključne leve potključne arterije. Svi pacijenti su bili muškarci, to su bili mladi, većinom relativno mladi, radno sposobni ljudi, samo jedan pacijent u otvornoj hiruškoj grupi je bio odmakle životne dobi, imao je značinu kardiomepatiju i atrijalnu fibrilaciju. Bilo je sedam povređenih udesu motornih vozila, jedan povređen pacijent kao pešak i jedna povreda na radu. Svi pacijenti u otvorenoj hiruškoj grupi su imali gradus četiri povrede, dok su pacijenti u tevar grupi imali gradus povrede od dva do četiri. Udružene povrede, kao što znamo, su značajan problem i po pravilu su prisutne kod ovih pacijenata sa odturom ispične aorte. Naši pacijenti su nešto stariji bili u tevar grupi. Što tiče trauma skorova, anatomski skorovi su bili nešto nepovoljniji kod pacijenata u tevar grupi, fiziološki su bili nešto nepovoljniji u otvorenoj hiruškoj grupi, dok je anatomsko-fiziološki triskor pokazao nešto veću šansu za preživljavanje kod pacijenata u otvorenoj hiruškoj grupi. Srednje vreme od povrede do ripera je bilo značajno veće u tevar grupi, a udaljenost povrede od odstupa leve potključne arterije je bilo skoro duplo veće kod pacijenata u tevar grupi. Srednje vreme operativnog tretmana će nešto duže traje od otvoren hiruški tretman, Heparinizacija je koristena samo kod plasmana tevara, dok su gubici krvi i nadoknada bili naravno značajni kod otvorenog hiruško tretiranih pacijenata. Što tiče mortaliteta, 40% u otvorenog hiruškoj grupi u roku od 30 dana nismo imali nijedan smrtni ishod kod pacijenta tretiranih hevarom, međutim, jedan pacijent je, nažalost, nekoliko dana nakon isteka tih 30 dana preminuo, tako da 25% nam je tu smrtnost. Paraplegije, slučaje paraplegije nismo imali. Dodržina ventilatorne podrške, boravka u šok sobi i hospitalnog boravka je značajno duže u tevar grupi, međutim ono ne oslikava dobro minimalnu invazivnost tevara, obzirom da su postala dva pacijenta koja su tevala izuzetno produženu ventilatornu podršku zbog teških udruženih povreda. Endolika nismo imali, imali smo jednu kasnu komplikaciju, znači u otvornoj hiruškoj grupi nismo imali kasne komplikacije u tevar grupi smo imali jednu trombozu kardiosuplojnog bajpasa koja je povedla simptomatski i imali smo jednu instant stenozu koja se manifestovala klaudikacijama sa dugim perimetrom hoda kod jednog mladog čoveka i za sada smo tretirali konzervativno. Njega i dalje pratimo i donosimo dalje odnoke kako ćemo ga dalje tretirati. I zaključio bi na kraju da su tupe povrede aorte po pravilu udružene sa teškim povredama drugih sistema koje otežavaju tretman i negativno utiču na prognozu. Endovaskular i tretman ovih povrede vodi manje mortalitetu i predstavlja metodu izbora. A u našem centru je otvorena hirurgija ovih povreda, hiruški metod lečenja za pacijente sa gradu s četiri povredom koji su hemodinamski nestabilni i ne reaguju na inicijalnu nadoknadu tešnostima. Naš centar nema off the shelf torakal endograftove, tako da to je sve. Hvala. Imamo vremena samo za jedno pitanje s publike. Evo. Dajte mikrofon, molim da se ovde. Ovde je napred mikrofon. Evo ga. Manojlović, Novi Sad. 
kolega Budaku koji prikazuje naše rezultate. Ovo je prilika kad već ima ovako konsenzus iskusnih kolega koji se bave grudnom aortom. Taj posljednji slučaj gde smo imali tu komplikaciju. To je stenoza tevara na već od 50% kod mladog čovjeka koji sad ima ispoljene klaudikacije. Da li ste vi imali takve slučaje? Ja sam u literaturi našao da to postoji baš kod tretmana tupe povrede aorte zato što se uvek radi prevelik oversizing kod takvih pacijenata. Mi za sada u principu preporučuje se hiruško rešenje koje nam u ovom momentu delo je zaista invazivno za tako mladu osobu. Pa sada pitanje za kolege koji su ovde u komisiji sede, da li neko ima takve iskustve i šta bi predložio? Teo, did you get the question? They treated a traumatic injury and in the follow-up there is a parietal thrombus in the stent that is reducing the flow to 50% and patient had claudications. Did you have instant thrombosis? This is a question also for Zoran, if Zoran is here. Because where is this stent? The, 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 the flow in the stent is reduced because of the thrombus inside the stent. That means we have the, we put a tivar and the tivar there is a stent, there is a thrombus. There is thrombus the in tivar stent, yeah. And yeah. where he, the, when the patient has claudication? On uh, just on, uh, some on a donium extremity. Na donium extremity. Nema, nema visceralne ischemije. The problem is we we know from the IVAR and the IBD if we are giving the anti-platelets, uh, aspirin, uh, clopidogrel, or even the anti-coagulation, then uh, it's going maybe to reduce and there is going to come back again. So that means uh, the thrombus will again fulfill the the <laughs> the IVAR. We will have again instant thrombosis. For for me, if you think that the problems and this claudication is coming about are coming from Tivar, what is 50% is mm, that this cause the claudication. I'm not sure, but I will maybe rely on that with a new graft, because maybe in this acute situation when we had the coagulation disturbances of hematological disorders during the rupture, if it was the ruptured uh, traumatic, I will rely on that in this situation with yeah. the new stand graft taking the same, but also, okay. and maybe take the, then the antiplatelets for one uh, year or for six months more to prevent this restenosis. Yeah. But again, uh, thrombus of 50% in tivar causing the claudication, maybe there is some other reason, spinal uh, yeah. stenosis or some other. Hvala, Hvala profesore. To je dakle reč o pacijentu koji ima 22 godine. Izvinjavam se, doktor Budakov, nemam vremena za dugačku diskusiju. Možemo i kasnije na pauzi za ručak o tome. Ja pozivam prezentavajuće sljedeće sesije da ne bi kasnili s programom. Profesor Kostić, profesor Ličević, izvolite.